On this episode of Fee-Based Financial Planning Mastery, I'm going to talk about wowing your clients. You see, people will pay to be wowed. Running a successful fee-based financial planning business is tough, and escaping the shackles of a commission-based financial planning practice is terrifying. When all you want to do is learn from those who know, learn from financial planners who are there on the front lines doing it each and every day. What if you could just open their kimono and take a look inside to learn what works and what doesn't? Now there's a place where the secrets to running a fee-based financial planning business are revealed to those who believe. Fee-based financial planning mastery. Ease your mind. Hi everyone, it's Scott Plaskett here and thanks for joining me. In this podcast, you will learn what's working and what's not in the world of fee-based financial planning. In each episode, I'm going to open my kimono and let you take an insider's look at what's working and what's not in my practice to help you take your business to the next level. I've been a fee-based certified financial planner since the early 90s, so believe me, I know the challenges you're facing. So get ready to learn not from a teacher, coach, or guru but from a colleague who's on the front lines just like you. And I'd like to invite you to subscribe to my email internet newsletter to get the most up-to-date tips on how to build and grow your fee-based financial planning practice by going to fee-basedfinancialplanningmastery.com. Can you say that, I don't know, I'm a bit overwhelmed? It's ever since I started this podcast, it's been an interesting experience. And one of the things that has just recently started to happen, and it's just, I guess, what happens when, uh, when you start gaining traction is that now... I've been sending, you know, I sent out an email um, every so often saying, hey, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to give me a, to send me an email and let me know uh, what your questions are and I'll be happy to answer them. And all of a sudden, boom, 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 I get question after question. So if I'm a little slow in getting back to you, I do have a day job and I do have to take care of business in, uh, in, in my neck of the woods. But at any event, I did want to address one question that really seems to come up quite a bit. For people who are transitioning to a fee-based program, uh, so I thought I'd answer it uh, on this episode, and then you know, for everybody who did request uh, an email response from me, I will get back to you individually uh, to your particular question. But in general, the question is, it, it has to do with the way that the fee-based structure works and the way that the the whole process of generating revenue works. So let me just, I'll just give you how the, the process works. For our firm, what we're doing is we're simply bringing people in and promoting our financial planning services, and we charge a fee for that. The fee can be anywhere from 2000 to $10,000, and it all depends on what is involved in the plan and what the, the client is, is requiring from us. So we will actually charge a fee. We charge it to their credit card. We pay, you know, half the fee is charged right up front. As soon as they uh, agree to moving forward, we sign a letter of engagement and then we charge the fee up front. And then the second half of the fee is charged two months later uh, and then it uh, moves on from there. And then every year thereafter, we have a maintenance fee or a retainer fee or whatever you want to call it that kicks in. And every year, uh, clients pay, you know, again, anywhere from 1000 to $5,000 a year uh, in order to maintain, have us maintain their plan for them and to keep everything on track. Now, that is completely separate separate from any implementation. So look at it this way. Look at your business in two different silos. You've got your financial planning silo and then you've got your implementation silo. Most people exist in the implementation silo because that's the only place they've ever known where they're going to generate revenue. I'm talking about migrating your business into the first silo, which is the financial planning silo, which is where you're going to be charging for your advice like any professional does. That fee is completely independent of any implementation. So keep that in mind. That's the, the one thing. That's where I'm very, very adamant about that is that you have to be able to charge. And my goal is always to make, make my business operate on those initial fees and the annual retainer fees. And so any implementation revenue that we receive would be considered gravy. And that's, that's, you know, that's the way I like to look at things. So, you know, make sure you're pricing your, your fees at, at such a level that you could, in essence, 
operate and service every client on that particular fee without having to worry about any implementation because not all clients are going to implement. Now, the majority will because once they've worked through your, your whole financial planning process, they will come back to you and say, okay, now how do I get this done? I want to make this a reality and they're not going to want to go anywhere else. So that's, uh, you know, that that is a good thing. So firstly, make it, you know, I want to make it very clear that, you know, we do charge an initial fee for the writing of the financial plan. We charge it to their credit cards and that's completely separate from any implementation. Now, on the implementation side, again, I'm very adamant about being fully transparent on that. So the way we simply do it is when we uh, implement a client's uh, investment portfolio, we charge a percentage of assets. So it's a you know very similar process uh, to what most people are doing. They're charging a certain percentage of, of assets under administration. And we partner with investment counselors and portfolio managers and work together with them to coordinate that investment into the client's financial plan and make sure that the financial plan, uh, the investment investments within the plan are working properly to help the, the clients achieve their financial goals. So we're coordinating all of that on their behalf and working with the uh, the investment counselor and making sure their tax positions and the efficiencies and everything. We're working very close with the investment firms. So we're just not the ones in our case because we most of our uh, arrangements are referral agreements. We're actually not the ones who are pulling the triggers on the underlying securities. So we're not doing the security selection. We're doing the oversight and implementation. So we do receive, as I I say we do receive a percentage of assets under administration that fee is charged to the client's uh, account and as a result you know it's fully disclosed to the client they see the fee come out you know they complain about it every time we get together review it they say oh the fees there are the fees because everything's finally fully disclosed what they aren't used to and most people are going to find this is the case what people are not used to is actually seeing the fees that they're paying because most Often, clients are so used to having the fees embedded in the, in the performance, and they're just not seeing it. I mean, they could have a fee of 4 or 5%, and they don't even know it. And oftentimes, they don't care because if they're seeing that their investments are earning 8 to 10%, well, what do they care? But the reality is, as soon as the market's turned down, all of a sudden, now they start getting really upset because now they're not only seeing themselves lose money, but they also recognize that there's fees coming out. And so they get pretty bitter at that. So we want to make sure that everybody's aware of what they're paying for the services that they're receiving. Now, you know, that oftentimes you'll find when you get into the fee-based approach, that will become a competitive advantage for you. And you will find that people will so quickly open up to you and they will they will actually see you as a breath of fresh air because you're not afraid to talk about fees. I mean, everybody, let's get real here. We do need to be compensated for what we do and we need to be compensated well. We're not going to do this just to be, you know, to earn a meager existence. People don't want to work with people who are not successful. So, they are willing to pay for it, but they're only willing to pay for it if they're receiving value. And that's why all of what we do is all about creating value. So we do charge uh, a percentage of assets when we do implement for the uh, on client's behalf. That is a tiered scale, just like any traditional scale, where the more you have, the, the lower the uh, fee is going to be, uh, or lower percentage is going to be, and then you just move forward with that. Now, in Canada, where I operate, we don't have fully transparent uh, insurance compensation. So, uh, you know, we do receive commissions from insurance policies because we do feel it's important the clients to have proper insurance in place. And again, I don't see where that's a negative, especially if I could find a way of making the fees completely transparent. Well, I would. And clients are aware of what we're getting. Uh, we do, you know, reveal the compensation and, and uh, there's no, we're not hiding that fact because all of the recommendations that we're making are coming from a financial planning perspective. They're coming from, well, the plan shows a shortfall in this area. Here's the analysis that we've done. And this is why we recommend that you have this level of coverage, whether it be living benefits or life insurance or uh, you name it. So we do still receive compensation uh, through a commission structure that way. Now, I do, I am aware that in the United States, there are some companies that are unbundling their compensation for the insurance side of things. And so you can actually, as an advisor, charge whatever you want for that. That has yet to come to Canada. So we're kind of, you know, we're dealing with what we've got. Again, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not too comfortable when, uh, either, when a, a, a fee-based or a fee-only firm says, oh, no, we don't, we don't charge, we don't receive any commissions from anything. But then the question is, well, how do you implement? How do you actually implement for a client? Well, we refer that out. Well, you know, what you're doing there is you're referring it out and, you know, maybe they're referring it out to another organization that you have a, an interest in. And so my question is, are you disclosing that, you, that there is a, a, an embedded conflict of interest there? 
there. Uh, I just like to keep everything very simple and say, look, I'm the licensed agent. I'm going to be the one that's going to be writing uh, the policy. And as a result, we're receiving compensation. There is a form uh, that discloses all of that and it simply works well. So, you know, as we go and as we get new, uh, new type of product structure, I'm sure over the next handful of years, things are going to change in Canada uh, simply because it's the insurance industry is challenged right now. I mean, when we've got higher reserve requirements, we've got lower interest rates on their long bonds. They just, they're simply, they're, they're squeezing. They're, they're very, very, it's very tough for them to, uh, to keep the profits going. So that's got to come out of somewhere and it's coming out of uh, increased uh, premiums for clients. So you can see the premium schedules are increasing as a result on the insurance side. And the next thing that's going to happen is we're just going to start to see compensation coming down. I see the answer to that is that they're going to start going into an unbundled compensation structure. Uh, I hope that they do. I can't wait until they do. Uh, but until they do, you know, we're having to deal with what we've got because we want to make sure the client's service properly. So hopefully that explains to people how that works. And, you know, you'll find that when you get into a fee-based model and you start charging the fees up front, especially for people who are starting out and just getting into the business and just, uh, you know, they don't have the, the book of business to, to rely on for the, you know, ongoing, you know, reoccurring revenues that come from that. Well, you know, when you can come in and with a, from a financial planning perspective and you're charging, say, $2,000 for a financial plan and you can, you know, you, you're out there and you're looking for new clients and you're bringing them on. Let's say you bring on a client a week. Uh, you know, there's, you know, eight thousand dollars in uh, in revenue for that particular uh, month and that's just coming from the financial planning that's not coming from any of the implementation which inevitably is going to happen so uh, you know it very quickly begins to uh, allow you to make some pretty decent money uh, and to to create a really thriving practice which you can then use the uh, the revenue that's coming in to reinvest back in your business and reinvest back in technology and services and and uh, structures that are going to service the client extremely well and turn your clients just into raving fans. So, uh, you know, that just wanted to clear that up because that was one of the the, uh, questions that was coming in quite often. We've had uh, quite a few people asking that question. And so I just wanted to clear that up on the uh, episode today. So hopefully that helps. Uh, Any other questions, feel free, you know, absolutely, uh, you know, send them over, email them to me. I'm happy to answer anything that, uh, that I can. I just want to make sure that everybody's clear on how we're doing it so they can, you know, hopefully model their practice uh, after ours and you know as a result we're you know I'm finding it interesting we're getting a lot of uh, communication as I said earlier uh, people are emailing me I'm saying I'm probably getting an email a day from uh, people who are either just finding the show uh, on iTunes or just finding our website or have heard about it from somebody else and they've got questions and so you know we're getting more and more there's more and more of my time now is being put into answering these questions so if you're interested and this is something that we're toying with uh, right now. We're looking at some other solutions that are going to allow you to completely see the behind the scenes of our business and to completely see all of what we do, the marketing, the, the technology, the systems, the workflows, the process, the you name it, the, everything, all the, cl- all the compliance approved marketing that we've put together, everything. I mean, because there's a lot that goes into managing and, and operating a, a fee-based practice and how we do our charging and the merchant accounts and, and uh, referral agreements and letters of engagement, all this sort of stuff, everything that goes into it, you know, I think is valuable to everybody. Well, it's very difficult to get that information out there. So if you're interested in finding out more about that, it's not not something that's going to happen anytime really soon, but if you are interested, then go to uh, ilovefinancialplanning.com and just register there because we are thinking about putting together some sort of an academy type thing where people can uh, register for finding out more and getting true behind the scenes, you know, fully operational. Here's how it works. Here's the system. If you're, you know, we use Salesforce and we're, we're toying with the idea of if you're using Salesforce or contemplating using Salesforce, then we're just going to give you our template. And that template is going to uh, uh, give you all the workflows and systems systems and everything that we already have operating in our practice that will simply, uh, you know, you basically, it's a turnkey approach. So if you're interested in that, definitely check out ilovefinancialplanning.com and register there. And that'll just put you on a, on a early notification list. Anybody who goes on that list, uh, because that really is the list that's going to tell me whether or not I should put some more time and energy into developing something like that. And if, if it does start to show that there's a lot of interest in that, then absolutely. I mean, I'm I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a business owner. I'm not going to not go in that direction because if there's a need that I want to uh, be able to fill it. And I think there's a, you know, I think it's a need that people would really value. So, um, 
if you're interested, go to ilovefinancialplanning.com and register there. And I'm pr- I will assure you that anybody who's on that list, if we decide to move forward with something, it's that list of people that are going to get extra bonuses and extra special things because you're the ones who are letting me know that, you know what, there is something out there and uh, maybe we can just sort of open that up to, uh, to some more people that way. So if you're interested, ilovefinancialplanning.com, check it out and register. And now for our feature segment. So someone now has called you and they want to get together. What do you do? What do you do at that point? What's going to set you apart from the rest of the competition? There's a lot that needs to go into wowing a client. All right. There's a lot of thought process and forethought and, you know, really mapping out how you're going to wow a client. And it all starts well before they step into your office. So I'm going to talk about a little bit of, well, definitely we're going to spend a lot of time talking about wowing a client, but I'm also going to talk about some examples of, of a poor client experience. And, you know, I don't have to go back very far. I'm just going to go back a few days to uh, two stores. It blew me away. Two stores that I went to. So it was Sunday and uh, I had to go to a pool company store and I had to go to a shoe store and I was with my daughter and we went to the pool company store because I needed to get a water sample taken care of just to make sure that all the chemical levels in the pool were all set properly. So I showed up to the pool store. It was 9.30 in the morning and the hours on the, the door said they were open at 11. And I thought, oh, great. You know, you get there early trying to get your day all set up and put together. And then you get there and they're not open, not open till 11. Okay, first of all, client experience number one says that most people don't want to be you know, wasting their Sunday, especially on a beautiful Sunday, running around middle of the day. They want to get all their stuff done in the morning and get back in the afternoon and get back even early more in mid morning to get their day started to start enjoying their day with your with their family and friends. Now, here's what happens. So I show up at the at the pool company and I drive up and I see the sign says they're open at eleven. It's nine thirty. I go to the front door and it's open. And I thought, oh this is cool. So I walked in and uh, I noticed that the lock on the door had been, it had been opened, uh, but the lock had been closed. So basically the door wasn't closing all the way. And I could see a guy standing in there. So I walked in and I said, hey, how are you? You know, I saw that the sign on the door said, you're not open till 11, but it's 930, the door was open. So I decided to come in. I said, I'm really just looking, just need to get a, uh, a water sample done. Uh, can you do that? And the guy looks at me and he goes, oh, geez, you know, he says, Honestly, I don't, I don't even know how to turn the computers on. That water sample, he says, that's so far out of my league. I, I have no idea. The girls aren't in to, that normally do that, and I, I have no idea how to do that. And I thought to myself, what the hell are you doing? I mean, here I am. You can wow me here by saying, you know what, no problem. But the bottom line was, he said, you know, and finally another guy, while I was there, another guy showed up, and he goes, hey, Frank, you know how to do the water sampling and all this sort of stuff? So... He said, well, I really don't. I haven't done it for a long time. You know, and the experience was like, oh my gosh, what is going on here? So anyways, it ended up that I finally, I gave him my my water bottle, uh, my water sample. And I said, look, I've got a few other errands to run. I'll, uh, I'll come back closer to 11. And he says, yeah, come back. He says, we're open now. You know, anyway, somebody's here. So if the girls get here early, we'll get them started on it. And you can come back. And I thought, okay, well, that, that helped. That was better. It, it sort of brought it back to even keel. But it was still very frustrating because, you know, again, all I wanted to do was get in and out and get my day started with. So then I had to go get some shoes for my daughter. And we knew uh, the shoe store was not too far away, so we went over. And by this point, it was about quarter to 11. And I showed up, shoe store, was the sign saying the door? Doesn't open till 11. I thought, okay, it's 1045. No problem, I'll be able to go and, and uh, get in and you know, in a few minutes. And I see that there's somebody standing at the cash register. So I knock on the door, and they you know, come through, and you know that's, that classic where they come up to the first door, they unlock it, they get to the second door, they fiddle around trying to get it unlocked. They finally unlock it and then they open it at hair. And I said, oh, I just, I, I saw you were there and I thought I could get uh, started early. And she looked at me and she goes, we don't open till 11. And I, my girls aren't here, so nobody's going to be able to help you. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what are you doing? I mean, first of all, it's going to take me 10 or 15 minutes just to find what I'm looking for. You've got to know the store a little bit. So why can't you just let me in and let me, you know, wander around looking for the shoes that I need for my daughter? when uh, and it, you know and most of the shoes are right on the on the shelf it's not like they've got to go to the back room and get certain sizes all the sizes are right out there and i thought wow i mean what kind of service is that especially when you, you know you go back to it and you look at the logic behind what i'm trying to do i'm trying to get out early in the morning i'm trying to get my day started i'm trying to get my day done so i can get back and enjoy my time with my family but 
lo and behold, they're not there to really to do anything. And it just is so frustrating. Now, what should they have done? Well, here's what I would do. If I was, and I've, I've said this to my wife a lot, I said, you know, there's so many stores and, show, and, and operations that I could run that would just make clients come back time and time again that would be great. And it doesn't take much. Here's what I would have done in this situation. Number one, if you don't want to open your store until 11, fine. Put on your sign that you're not going to open, that the sign says it's not going to open until 11 or whatever it is. First of all, that's the wrong thing to do because you want to, in that situation, you want to promote the fact that you're open early and you're going to close early because everybody wants to get back to, uh, to their friends and family. And so why don't you come early and get the day started and whatnot. Now, so let's say we're going to just follow the, the rule here, which says it opened at 11. So what I would do is I would then have all of my staff come in 30 minutes early. Bottom line is staff starts at 1030, period. And that's what I do at my office. I, you know, our office has uh, hours at, uh, that start at, at uh, 830 or 9 o'clock, and I make sure all my staff is there before that period of time. And why do I do that? Well, bottom line is this. We ha- now have an opportunity to wow our clients. So in this example, in this pool company or this shoe store, here's an opportunity to wow a client. Let's say you get there. So you, 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 the sign says you're not open till 11. You have your staff come in at 1030 and you get everything ready to go. So basically 15 minutes before the door is even supposed to open, you are set to go. Now, there's always people who are going to show up early because in North America, we tend to like lineups. We tend to enjoy lining up and we're really good at doing that. I mean, you don't even have to tell people to line up. And if there's a group of people, they'll, they'll form a nice, nice orderly line in front of a store because I don't know, there's this whole stress that goes into, well, I was here first and you were here second and so on and so forth. So I would have it set up and I would then have the door open. So if you get there early, guess what? You pull on the door and it opens. I would even turn the sign to say we're open just to give that give people that feeling of, well, it says 11 o'clock, but the sign says they're open. They give a little tug on the door and it opens. Then as they, as they walk in, I would say, hey, come on in. Looks like you're trying to get your day started early. Why don't you come on in? We don't normally don't open till 11, but you know what? Since you're already here and we're already set up, come on in and get your, get your day started. How much of a wow experience is that? Does that ever happen? Never. Ever does it happen. All it takes is a half hour extra. Bring your staff in a little bit early and then make a big deal out of it. You know, put some theater into the whole process. Choreograph how people would respond to somebody coming in early. I was at a, uh, a burger joint, a very sort of a gourmet burger joint the other day. And we got there, we were starving. It was, you know, we just, we were hoping to get there, but the sign said it didn't open till noon. And I thought, oh my gosh, here we go again, you know, a burger joint. Why don't they open at 1130? Most people understand that lunch is probably at noon, but the reality is you're going to get there a little early because you're probably hungry. Well, all they had to do was open at 1130, but they didn't. And they sort of, you know, you could see them in there moving around and, and getting everything all set up, but they wouldn't open the door. So now, as I say, everybody is normally pretty good at making lines, but what they had out front of their store were a whole series of picnic tables. And... So my family was sitting at a picnic table and there were other families sitting at picnic tables. But, you know, there was a certain order. We were the first ones there. We got there fairly early. And then other people started showing up and they were looking to, to, uh, to go into the store as well. Well, I'll tell you, I was sitting there and I didn't even have to mention it to my wife until I mentioned it after the fact. And I said, how were you? How was, what was your experience like when we were sitting there in a beautiful day, sitting with our kids? What was your experience? She goes, I hated it. I was sitting there. I was all stressed because other people were showing up and they were standing closer to the door. And I thought, you know, we were here and it's a gourmet burger place and they've got to make each burger individually. And, you know, if we weren't there first in line, we were here early and you know all this. And I thought, wow, what a horrible experience while we were waiting to go into this burger joint and the burger joint didn't even know that that experience was going on. They could have avoided all of that by simply opening it up and letting us in. Put on the sign that it doesn't open till noon, but for the people that are really hungry, let them show up early because here's what happened. We walked in. Now, fortunately, it was very nice because, you know, Canadians seem to be very polite and the guy who was at the front of the, uh, who was basically right at the door, he looked up and he says, hey, you guys were here first, go on in, you know, and I said, wow, that is one of the nicest things you could do. Uh, and he let us in and we were, we were there because, you know, we were there first and he let us in and said, go on in. And everybody sort of instantly got into the order that they were, uh, that they arrived at. And, you know, it was very civil. Now we got into the restaurant or into the burger joint and what was there? Now they had a lineup of 30 people waiting to make their order. And when you're in a gourmet burger joint and they've got all these different choices and they make it from scratch, 
Now you've got people humming and hawing about what they're going to order. Then they put the order in and then the people have got to go make it and they make it from scratch. Well, it was just this total bottleneck that could have been completely avoided if that you show up early, you walk in, you make your order. So what if it, don't, if it doesn't say you open till uh, noon? If you're there early, get started early. You're going to make the clients feel better. Now, you don't want to promote that. You don't want to, but you want to make it seem like, hey, you know what? I'm here early and I recognize that you got here early for a reason. And that just flips the tables and makes people, gives people an appreciation, a sense that they're being appreciated. That would have gone a long way because my wife was sitting there instead of being able to enjoy, and I was sitting there as well, instead of being able to enjoy the time with our kids, we were sitting there getting stressed out but that we were going to have to wait in a lineup even though we were there first. So ridiculous, I know, but bottom line is all of this could have been avoided. And the reality it is it's reality that's what happens so those are some you know off the last three days that's basically what's happened in my life and those were three different stores that I went to and those were the different experiences so you know it doesn't take much and there's a lot of poor experiences now I want to talk about good experiences how do you set your fee-based financial planning firm up so you can give people a good experience now we've talked about now in my business I mean we're not on a retail location we are in an office building so it's not like we've got a, a storefront that we can open early and that sort of thing but Here are some examples of things you can do to make the experience of becoming a client of yours a great one. So starts off like this. So here's the process that we go through. So remember, we're starting this show saying, what would you do if just after somebody called you and said, hey, I want to get together with you. Great. Heard great things about you. Let's set up a time. Great. So what do you do? You, You book a time with them on the phone. Now, what's your process from this point forward? Well, here's what I would recommend. First off, is you're going to add your prospect information to your database. So all of their what I call tombstone information, their name and address and and whatever you can get from them, their email address, their contact information, all that sort of stuff, as much as you can. You don't want to sort of probe and you don't want to go into their birth date and their SIN number and all that sort of stuff for your social insurance number, social security number or anything like that at this point, because it's really not pertinent to the conversation. You want to get the information that basically is is uh, makes sense that you would have it. So contact information uh, and that sort of thing. Add any notes from your discussion because if you've had a conversation with the person and they've they've uh, you know they've talked to you a little bit on the phone, add some notes because hopefully when you were talking with them on the phone, you were asking them questions. You were asking them open-ended questions to help them just explain what it is that they were looking for to help pre- pre-qualify them a little bit on the phone. Well, make those notes in your system. So add any notes from your discussion uh, that may be of interest to know before you have that meeting so you can refer back to them because if you start doing this a lot, you're going to start having many, many more meetings and it's very difficult to keep everything in order. So that's why a good CRM uh, is important and uh you know, that's, uh, that's how I would recommend. So set them up on the system, put to all their contact information in, and then book the appointment on your calendar through the, the contact relationship system. So you book it on the, uh, on the calendar. So now we've got a record of when the appointment's going to be. Now, what we don't do is we don't track the prospect. We track the opportunity because everybody that comes in, it's a various, op- it's an opportunity for us to work with them. And so we're going to track the opportunities. Now, all of those opportunities have to be related back to a particular household or a lead or whatever you want to call it. But we want to track the opportunities. So on our system, and as you know, we use Salesforce, we add the household information or company information or account or whatever you want to call it, and then add the contacts that are associated with that household. So the way we, our system, we look at it is we say, if you're, if we just know, have your name and information, we haven't booked an appointment, you're going to be considered a lead on our system. But as soon as you contact us to book an appointment, we're going to convert you to becoming a household. And that household will then have contacts within the household. If you're an individual and you're not married, then you are the household. So then it's basically, uh, it's a one person household or what we call a person account. And so we set it up where we then set the information up for the household, then we set up the contacts in the household. And then we associate to that household an opportunity. And the opportunity is for, you know, when we people come to meet with us, they're coming to meet with us for a financial planning opportunity. So we then create a financial planning opportunity and everything for that for that relationship or that opportunity is tracked against that uh, that particular opportunity. So an opportunity is, is it's, just, it's another object where if you, to talk tech, you know, computer ease, uh, a household is an object, a contact is an object, well, we've now got opportunities as objects and we can relate those objects to other objects. So we're relating the opportunity back to the contact and back to the household. 
Now, we've identified on our system all the different types of opportunities that we have. You see, uh, when you track opportunities, that's important because most people will have multiple opportunities and you want to make sure that none of the opportunities don't fall through the cracks. So if you don't track them, you'll lose sight of them and they'll just all become one big opportunity that you'll you'll lose sight of some of the little details that are there. And so we just want to make sure that the opportunities, all the different types of opportunities are tracked. So what we've done is we've gone into our system and we said, okay, we have various types of opportunities, financial planning opportunities. We have investment opportunities. We go as far as, um, you know, those opportunities could be retirement plan opportunities, taxable account opportunities, education savings plan opportunities, and trust account opportunities, that sort of thing. We have living benefit opportunities. So there's an opportunity for critical illness insurance. There's an opportunity for long-term care, for long-term disability, for health benefits, for group benefits, you you name it. Uh, We have opportunities for wills because we want to make sure that our clients' wills are up to date. Uh, So we track that opportunity. We have other executive companies compensation plan opportunities, so individual pension plans, retirement compensation arrangements, that sort of thing. So we put together all the different types of opportunities. We say, well, what what are the different things that we can work with a client on? Or what are the different things that we're going to be keeping track of? For example, we don't actually write wills because we're not lawyers. However, it's important from a financial planning perspective that the client does have an up-to-date will. So one of the opportunities we have is a will. And so we track the will, we go into it, we say, okay, is the will updated? We put a copy of it there. And so it's very easy for going back to uh, after the fact. So we track all the opportunities. Now, it's important that you map out the stages of each opportunity that that you're going to go through with each opportunity. Because what that does is it allows you to identify all the tasks to trigger as you move the opportunity along from stage to stage. And this will help in the automating of your system. So, you know, we all know if you've put an insurance policy in place, there's a certain procedure that you go through from the taking the application or or generating the illustration, taking the application, uh, moving through underwriting and all the stuff that goes along with that, uh, placing the policy, getting paid for the policy, all that sort of thing. So there's all the different stages you go through. We've done that and we've mapped out all the stages for all of our investment opportunities, all of our living benefit opportunities, all of our will opportunities, all of our uh, financial planning, you name it. We've mapped out all the different stages that we're going to go through. And that just helps us track things uh, along, but it also helps in the automating. Now, then we book the initial appointment and link it to the financial planning opportunity. So remember, in this example, we've booked a, a, a meeting with a client or a prospective client. They want to come in and talk about their financial planning. So we book the opportunity against the financial plan. So when it shows up on our system, it shows up as here's the, the, the meeting subject. So it's a meeting to, you know, initial meeting. And it's linked to the opportunity, and the opportunity is basically financial planning, and then it's and then they have the client's name, so we can tell exactly who it is, and you know that's that's the way Salesforce works, and it's brilliant, it's brilliant. So now we track the opportunity. So once we've done that, that's the second step. Now we go into the third, which now by tracking that and 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 setting the stages properly, this will trigger tasks to be completed. At this, at various stages. So, at this stage, we now set the stage to. If we book the opportunity, the stage moves to what's called pending first meeting, and that's simply a stage that we know. When I look at that very quickly, I can see here are the opportunities, and here are the ones that are pending first meeting, which tells me the meeting's been booked, and I just am waiting for it to happen. Now, it also triggers because now we've got this, this, the triggers off of that opportunity stage. We now trigger a confirmation email. So, as soon as we set that stage. It sets a task to say, okay, send a confirmation email of the appointment. Now, in that email, what we've done is we've templated the email and we've put a Google map. Now, in the Google maps, we put a little, a little uh, uh, we basically go into it because now we know the information for where the client's coming from. We go in and we say, well, this is where our office is located on Google maps. This is where the client's coming from. We key that information in and it creates a customized directional, a customized map for how to get to our office, and we link that in the email. We also include links to the various testimonials for uh, you know testimonials that we have, so people, when they get the email, they'll take a look at what other clients have been saying about us. We include links to other articles, appearances that we've had, anything that you've been involved with to promote your credibility. Because again, as you know, in our case, we're an independent financial planning firm, so we don't have the cred- credibility that comes from being associated with a big brokerage or a big, uh, a big bank or, or something like that. So we need to do that in our own way. 
Now, we include the details of the meeting, place, and time, and encourage them not to bring anything with them unless they have something specific they'd like to go over with us. Now, again, we've talked about our process in, in previous episodes. You can go back to those and listen to the sort of the scripting and stuff that we go through. But again, we promote not bringing anything with them, with them. And that, you know, gives us a bit of a competitive advantage because, you know, uh, it just allows you to be a little bit different. Now, I've heard of uh, of an advisor, and I thought this was a pretty pretty novel way of doing things. And we haven't done it just because it, it just doesn't work as well. But if you're in a downtown core and you've got sort of clients clustered around you, what this advisor does is he's uh, he arranges for a limousine to pick up the client and bring them back to their uh, to their home. So instead of that client having to worry about driving. A limo comes, picks them up, brings them over, and uh, and sets it. I mean, that in itself is a wow experience. You could also have a reserved parking spot if, with uh, with the client's name on it. So, you know, if you have the ability to have a variety of spots and you can put a sign up there, um, then you can put the client's name on it. And so that uh, that goes a long way as well. So again, just little things that you can do to, to create that wow experience. Now, when they come in for the first meeting, Design and choreograph a welcome procedure for the prospect. So here's an example. So the initial point of contact then gets up. So when the client walks in, the door opens, and it's, you know, our initial point of contact would be our the receptionist usually. So they get up, introduce themselves, and they shake their hand. And then they ask if they can take their coats, uh, and then they provide them with a list of beverages to choose from, uh, and, and then they're directed to sort of a comfortable waiting area. After the coats are hung up, the prospects are asked what they would like as a result of reviewing the, the menu. Uh, and then the beverage information that, that is obtained is then as the, uh, the person goes to get the beverage information, they remember what it is and we log that and record that in our, our database. Now that's not unique. It's not uh, um, you know, new. I'm sure you've heard that one before. But how many people are doing it? So we remember what they put. So we just put a little note saying, well, here's what they had at that first meeting. And so we've got a, a little field that uh, tracks that. So it can be changed. If they come in the next time and, you know, happen to change their, their beverage choice, well, then we can, we can update that. The beverages are brought to the prospect in the waiting area. And now they're left in the waiting area for about four or five minutes. Now, we do this purposely because I want them to take in the scenery. I want them to, uh, you know, really take a look around because things have been strategically set up there. I have what I call my ego wall, and it's basically pictures of me at a microphone doing a radio show, um, pictures of me with celebrities, uh, you know, media celebrities. I've got a picture of me with the Stanley Cup uh, for, for any of the hockey buffs out there. Uh, pictures of me. I've got a, a my wife Kathy and I were on a cover of a magazine, so we've got that you know front and center. Uh, pictures of me in the newspaper, articles that we've been involved with. Whatever shows you off as a person who's in the know or sort of a person of of importance. This is where you get a chance to very easily, without having to say anything build credibility. So have that ego wall. Make sure you've got something that shows off who you are. And you know what? If you haven't been in the paper and you haven't done any media work, that doesn't matter. Then get some pictures of you catching a big fish or get a picture of you with friends around or if you have a cottage or if you have a favorite place that you like to go, put some pictures that show who you are, that give a little bit more, a little bit background with you. I remember when I was years ago, really, really young, I went into an advisor's office who I was, uh, this was before I was even a financial planner, and uh, I wanted him to sort of, you know, start me out and get invest, his, invest my money. Um, and behind his desk, he had all these pictures, great pictures of him holding these massive fish. Now, he didn't have anything to do with media or, you know, self-promotion. It was just really cool pictures of him doing what he loves, and he was an avid fisherman. Well, that was just, it gave me a sense of who he was, and so that goes a long way in help, helping to build a relationship with that prospective client before you even get there. Now, after the few minutes have come and gone, then the planner comes out and greets the prospect and introduces themselves to them and invites them to in, invites them into a meeting room, boardroom or wherever you have your meetings. Now, I recommend a meeting room as opposed to an office because you can keep things lean and mean that way. I personally, I don't even have an office. So the nice thing about that is when you can get to a, a no office solution, which is a Dan Sullivan promoted thing, and it's, it's brilliant when you can get to that point. When you can get to a, a no office solution, you basically show up and you're lean and mean as well. You're not carrying all this stuff. You're not sort of hiding in your cave where you, you, you know, your stacks of, of information is sort of build up and build up and build up. You know, I go into accountants offices sometimes and oh my gosh, it's just crazy. You walk in 
And there's files all over the place. There's boxes of files everywhere. It looks horrible. And these are some high-end accounting firms, and it just it just doesn't look good. So you know, if you have a meeting room, uh, or if you can set up a meeting room, or turn your office from a meeting from an office into a boardroom, then that will go a long way. So then we go in and we we go into the into the room now. We go in, the, the planner then goes into an initial meeting script. And so I've talked about the meeting script in the past, but the important part of this script is to get across to the prospect that the purpose, what the pers- purpose of the meeting is. And the purpose of the first meeting is twofold. Number one, it's for the planner to get to know what it is that the prospect is really there for and to assess as to whether or not the planner's services are appropriate for what the prospect is looking for. The second thing, is for the prospect to be provided with the opportunity to find out more about the planner, what the services are, and whether or not these services are indeed what they're looking for. That's important to get that across. So whenever scripting you put together, make sure you have a two, step in, two steps in, in there. Then, and this is important, always have them to agree, always have them agree to this fact. If it's determined by the planner that they feel that they can provide assistance with what the prospect is looking for, the planner will recommend a second meeting. So this is what I'm talking about. Make sure that in the the initial scripting, you say by the end of the meeting, typically here's what's going to happen. So number one, make sure the planner, uh, make, make sure they're aware that the planners really assess whether or not it makes sense for a second meeting. If it is determined that the prospect feels what the planner provides is what they're looking for, then they will also agree that the second meeting is appropriate. But if either the planner or the prospect feels that it's not appropriate to get together for a second meeting, that they will state this and have everyone agree that nobody will be and, and, and that nobody will be offended if one party comes to that conclusion. This is this really clears the air and shows that the prospect that you're serious about who you work with. It provides a sense of scarcity and exclusivity, and the prospect realizes that they will not be pressured into a second meeting. Everything on this on, is on the table on the outset, and everybody knows the rules of engagement. This is probably one of the biggest, if you take anything from this episode, this is the thing I want you to take. Have them almost agree to what's going to happen at the meeting. You say to them, listen, I'm here to, to do one thing, and I'm here to assess whether or not what it, is that we, if what it is that we do is really appropriate for what you're looking for. And I understand also that you're here to basically kick my tires and determine if what it is that we do is what you're looking for. So if we both agree that it is, then we'll say that and we'll book another meeting to take a look at the details. But if one of us really feels that it's not appropriate, then you know we're all big boys and girls here. Let's just tell each other so that there's no confusion. If I don't feel it's appropriate, I'll tell you and I hope that you would give me the same courtesy. Honestly, whenever you say that, you see them nodding their head going, thank you, yeah, that makes complete sense. Now they know that they've got a way out. And nobody's going to be offended because the rules of engagement are on the table. Now, once we've done that, then the planner hands the prospect a clipboard. And on the clipboard is an initial questionnaire for the prospect to fill out with a cover letter. Now, the cover letter stresses the importance of filling it out independently from one another. So if they come in and it's a couple, it stresses, listen, this is your information. This is your opinion. No peeking on your on your spouses. Don't talk about it. We'll have that conversation when we get back together. Don't talk about it. No peeking. Do it for your own opinion. Now, the planner then excuses themselves to take care of, you know, something else that's going on and gives the uh, the prospects a chance to sort of sit there by themselves without any pressure to complete the form. And then basically you have some, some way of monitoring what's going on. So if there's a, you know, in our office, we've got a glass wall so we can actually see when the, the uh, prospect has pretty much completed the questionnaire. And so it just gives us a chance to, uh, you know, give them some privacy, but also now it gives them a chance to take in the surroundings. So what do I have in my uh, boardroom? Well, I've got all the different credentials that I've, that I've got. I've got my, you know, the CFP and chartered financial planning designation, and I've got the licenses and you know, all that sort of stuff. Everything that I'm, that, ha- that basically is provided to me in a certificate form, I put those certificates up there so people can see. Very much when you go to a doctor's office or dentist's office, you can see all the different certificates they've got. It's nice to see that, so it helps to build some credibility. 
Now, you go through the meeting as intended. Ask lots of open-ended questions. You know, why do you feel that way? Or can you explain that further? Or I want to be clear, you know, just because I don't want to miss things here. Can you put that another way? So ask questions. So when you're going through the questions that they filled it on the questionnaire, you know, you're going to ask them why they answered the way they did. And they're just going to go on and they're going to explain that to you. What you're looking for here is you want to, you know, find out what is the pain that they came to have resolved. Why do they want to come and see you? There's something bugging them that they want to get fixed that they feel that you're able to do. What is that pain? And so you want to really get clear on what that is. Then at the end of the meeting, this is when you're going to make your recommendation. And so you can sum it up by saying something like, you know, earlier we said we were going to be honest with each other and tell each other whether or not we felt it made sense to go forward. I'm going to go first. And here's what I think. After going through this, you know... I either think it makes sense or I don't think it makes sense. And then you say to them, okay, what do you feel? Do you think it makes sense to to get together for a second meeting uh, so we can look at the details or not? And basically, two people are going to say yes or one person is going to say no. And if that's the case, then if you're the one saying no, just make sure you've got uh, somebody that you can refer them to or a, a direction that you can refer them to. But, you know, chances are if you've done your work, your homework in uh, prior uh, and in your previous conversation with them, you kind of get a sense that, uh, you know, most people that are coming to see you are probably appropriate, but not everybody. And I've had to turn some people away because I just didn't feel it was worth their while uh, in, uh, in getting together. Uh, actually, oftentimes what I'll do is I'll turn them away, but I'll say, you know what, right now is probably not the right time because we, we do charge a fee for this. And I think that, you know, very simply, if there's a few things you need to get, you need to accomplish, first of all, why don't you accomplish those first? And then once you're done, then I think you're going to get more value from coming back and working with me. So you can sort of push them away nicely like that. Now, the final result, if it's yes for both, then you book your next meeting. Now, when you book the next meeting, you change the stage on the opportunity to now pending meeting number two, and this will trigger any tasks that need to take place, like a summary letter. If it's no, then you refer them to someone who you feel it's more appropriate for them to work with, or just refer them to a place that they can go to find somebody. If it's yes, provide them with, and and then if it is a yes, you want to then provide them with an information package on how to prepare for the next meeting. So we tell them here, here's a data and documents checklist, go through this checklist. And this is the information that I'm going to ask you to bring with you to our next meeting. We also include some more testimonials. uh, So it really just gives them some homework to do and it, it just gives them a nice takeaway that they can take with them. Now, before the next meeting, remember when we change the stage on the opportunity from pending meeting one to pending meeting two, that triggers more things to happen. So what does it trigger? Well, in our case, it triggers a summary letter. We send them a summary letter outlining the details that I recorded during the meeting. It goes a long way to to proving to them that you were listening and that you're serious about working with them. It also restates to them what the problems are that you revealed and allows them to agree or disagree with the summary. So just basically, it's a nice little touch. We send out a letter saying, listen... Here's a summary of what we found of, the, of my findings during the meeting. I think there's some areas that we can definitely help you with. These are the areas that, uh, that came to the surface. And, um, you know, it just allows them to sort of revisit that experience. And it puts a nice, uh, nice cozy feeling in them because now they're getting something from us as well. And it just sort of keeps the whole process moving along. When we started implementing that, our second meetings, I mean, virtually nobody ever canceled them. They just, uh, they carried on with them and it was great. Now, we also, just before the second meeting, have a confirmation call or, or an email to ensure that they're aware of their second meeting. So that just, again, you know, as a, a good firm, a good uh, professional firm does, always confirms the meeting. And when they come to their next meeting, now your greeter does the following. So the per- same person, or if it's a different person, we just basically chore- choreograph it. So this is what happens. They greet them and welcome them back to the office. They take their coat and they escort them to the waiting room so they can take in the scenery again. Now, we don't leave them there as long because, you know, they've already been there once. But, and oftentimes we find people are looking at other pictures so that maybe they caught some of the pictures but they didn't catch them all. And so they're going to start taking a look at the other pictures they haven't seen yet. And then we say to them, listen, can I get you a beverage? And, you know, that was, that was a little tea with a little honey in it, wasn't it? And for you, I think it was coffee with milk and sugar, right? Well, you know, yeah, we recorded that information from before, but it just shows positive intent. Oftentimes people are blown away by, wow, you remembered? And then they say, yeah, you know, yeah, we remember and it's just, you know, uh, how it works. And then we go and we bring it out to them and whatever. Sometimes people say, oh, you wrote that down, didn't you? And we say, yeah, we did. We wrote it down because we want to make sure that we always have what you like available for you when you come. They love that. The people love positive intent. They know you're tracking it. They know, you know, there's no secret there. And if they're smart, 
you know, and they're, they're aware of customer service, they're going to appreciate that. You know what? I would, I would love it if uh, companies would do more and more of this. Yeah, I know they're tracking it, but you know what? It shows that they're engaged. It shows that they really, really want to add value to, my, to the relationship that they have with me. So when they come to the next meeting, we you know offer them the uh, the beverage that they have, and then we you know carry on and move them right into the uh, the meeting room again. So then the planner greets them and invites them into the meeting room. Now the planner will ask to see their homework. What we're going to do is, as the planner, you're going to want to go through each document that they bring with them, and they're going to have a stack of documents with them. You go through each document, making sure that everything is there. Get a true assessment as to where they are and if you really do want to spend time working with them. This is your chance. You're now getting an opportunity to look at the details. You will know at that point whether or not you want to work with them. If you do, and chances are if you've agreed to a second meeting, it's because you do want to work with them, then it's just going to reconfirm that. But, you know, sometimes things come up and you realize, you know what, maybe this isn't a a case that I I should be taking on. And that's your opportunity to say no. Because if the client's coming back, they're probably really motivated to work with you. And so this is your last opportunity. So go through and get a really clear assessment as uh, as to where they're at. Now, if they made it to the meeting, as I said, it's safe to assume that you'd like to work with them. Now, you need to present your fee. And this is where a lot of fee-based planners will completely clam up. The way you do it again is you review each document that the client has. Review each component of your planning process and illustrate how these will do a complete overview of their financial planning needs to ensure nothing falls through the cracks and everything's coordinated. So what you're doing is you're basically saying all this stack of information I'm going through it. I'm taking a look at my notes from the from the previous meetings. All of this is what we require in order to go through a, a comprehensive plan. And thank you very much for bringing it all with you. Then you present your fee. Now, I have three different programs. So each program is priced based on the different stage of their financial life. And it's basically set up based on the fact that I know in people who are at the you know elimination of debt stage, well, I'm going to be focusing on elimination of debt, and there's really not going to be a lot of other complexities involved. So earlier in the in the uh, relationship, it's probably an easier plan to put together. As more time has gone on and they're older and, and you know more serious or closer to, to retirement, uh, or if they're business owner, oftentimes that can get more complicated as well. So we've got the eliminating debt stage. There's a wealth accumulation stage. Then there's the wealth, wealth preservation stage. And then each one of those previous stages, the elimination of debt stage, wealth accumulation stage, and the wealth preservation stage, we have a business owner version of each because business owners just have a unique a uniqueness to them because they do have that corporate entity that you can start doing a lot of planning with that uh, most uh, employed people don't have. So it's just a sort of a a supplementary uh, program that we put onto our uh, programs. So we've got those three core uh, programs and we present the fee. Now, I honestly wouldn't move forward with a plan for anything less than $2,000. Anything less would simply discount or undermine your value. There's been a lot of work leading up to this point. And people are kind of expecting at this point to have a a much higher fee than $2,000, that's for sure. But they're expecting to have something in that range. Now, when you present $2,000, then it's sort of like, yeah, that's pretty much where I thought it was going to come in. Oftentimes, you'll have people go, oh, really, that's it? Because they were expecting much more because of all the things you're going to be touching on. Anything less than $2,000, in my mind, at this stage of the game is simply going to undermine your value. And if you're not charging for it, it probably isn't worth very much. So this is where people will run into a big problem. If you don't charge for the financial plan, people will not really take the value or they they just won't appreciate it as much. My experience has been that whenever I raise my fee, people take me more seriously. There's a great quote um, uh, by, by a guy by the name of Joe Polish. And he basically says, when people pay, they pay attention. And I couldn't agree more. When people pay me, the implementation goes through the roof. They do everything that I say. They listen to what I have to say because they're paying me for it. We then get them to complete a letter of engagement. So it lays out all the terms that that we spoke about, you know, everything that we've talked about leading up to this point and now puts it in writing for them. And they're really, they find that very comforting. And then we only accept credit cards. Uh, that's just a, a, something that we do is that for our financial planning fees, we only receive credit cards. I don't like to have to send out invoices for checks on renewals and that sort of thing. I just want to have it pre-authorized and set to go. So we only accept credit cards and we authorize them for 50% of the fee immediately, 
50% of the fee in two months, and then annually on their anniversary for their renewal fee. And that's how it works on the on the fee side. And then we've got in the letter of engagement, they just sign for that, they sign the authorizations, and uh, everything's good to go. Then once we've done that, as soon as that's done, then we basically book the plan presentation part one meeting. And so again, you move it to move the stage on the um, opportunity from uh, from the pending meeting number two, and we have a stage called sale de- sales decision yes, and we also have one called sales decision no. If they've decided to go forward with your with the uh, planning services, we put it to sales decision yes. What does that do? Triggers a whole series of tasks that we can complete, and I mean there's a lot there because now we're formally setting up a client. On our system, so we update their data on our system to ensure all the information is recorded properly. We send out a, a, there's a task to send out a new client welcome kit. We put their base plan together. Uh, we ensure the the uh, plan presentation part one meeting has been booked. If not, we then book it, and that's just a, a safeguard uh, reminder that because uh, sometimes people can't book their their next meeting at that meeting. And so if they don't book it right then and there, what's going to remind you to go back and, uh, and make sure that was booked? So we have a, a task that we have to turn off to say, oh, yeah, that's been booked because oftentimes we haven't booked it and we need to go back to that. Now, a couple of notes that I want to uh, mention on this. Put a system in place to track the expiry dates of your client credit cards so that you can contact them the month that, month that their, their card expires to update the information that you have on your system so that you never run into a situation where a renewal is going to come up and you don't have a good a current credit card. Another point I want to make is never discuss detailed investment solutions during this meeting process. And I've talked about this in the past, but it's something that's very, very important. You never want to talk about solutions now because they're paying you to put solutions together. So don't talk about any solutions up front. Now, they may start asking about investments. Well, what type of investments do you use and all that? And you can give them the general information. But when it comes to the details for them, you can't answer that because you haven't done the analysis. And the plan is the analysis that you need to complete before you can properly address that investment need. And that's a start. I mean, that's the start uh, because you should then do the same thing for all of the stages you'll go through to complete the financial plan and properly deal with each opportunity. So what I do is you want to map out the stages for each opportunity type, manage the opportunities and then service the client. So, you know, as I'm going through, again, I started out with with the opportunity being our financial planning opportunity. But as I'm going through the writing of their financial plan, I'm recognizing here's the opportunity for their investments. Here's education opportunities. Here's insurance opportunities. And I'm putting all those opportunities in the system. Now, why am I doing that? Because I don't want to let anything fall through the cracks. So I know in that case, when I put all those opportunities, I have a stage, which basically is the first stage, and it's called need identified. This is when I've identified the need, I put it in there so I can make sure that when I get together for a review meeting, I'm going to basically bring that back up and say, hey, I identified this need, I want to have a conversation about it. This way, every time you get with a client, you sit down, you take a look at your opportunities list, you take a look at the stages. It will tell you exactly what you haven't dealt with yet. It also tells you what you have dealt with. So you don't look like a doofus when you go back and say, okay, it's time to talk about life insurance. And they say, well, we did that last time. And you say, oh, geez, sorry, you're right. You know, my mistake. That eliminates that. Also, compliance loves this procedure. And the reason being is that when you've identified something and you've dealt with it, and maybe they've come back and said no, you document that. The sales decision is no. If you've gone through and said, okay, I think you should take a look at some disability coverage because you've got this need, you go through the process, it comes back and they say, no, I'm just not interested, or no, I don't want to look at that right now. Fine. Then you change the opportunity stage to sales decision no. What does that do? Well, let's say a couple of years down the road, suddenly the client gets disabled, comes back and says, you know what? If I heard, I knew, I found out that there could have been some insurance I could have bought to buy all, to that would have protected me from all this. Why didn't you tell me about it? You go back to your notes and say, you know what? We actually did talk about that and such and such a date, and you actually decided against it. So we went through the whole analysis. You just didn't feel it was appropriate at that time. So there's some compliance benefits there. So it just it's a nice way of doing it, so you can properly. You know, just protect yourself from some of the some of the negatives that come from uh, people's emotional responses when they're basically up against a, a very challenging situation. For example, a, a disability that if you've dealt with it, at least you're you're protected. Now, it doesn't change the fact that you know you dealt with it. They decided not to 
take advantage of it and that could have benefited from it, that hurts in itself. But the reality is then, you know, at least you've got some, some documentation that says that you've covered that. So, you know, that's the wowing experience. Can you imagine if you were a client and you were going through all this and every step of the way you, something new came up, you got a new client welcome kit after you said yes, and you got home. Because remember, there's one thing, there's the buyer remorse, you know, when they're paying a few thousand dollars or up to $10,000, it could be, it could be fifteen, twenty thousand $20,000 for all I, I know. I mean, it all depends on the level of clientele you're working with. The point is, Sometimes people have some buyer remorse. Well, if the next day or the day after that, they get a nice package that they weren't expecting that has a nice, you know, a great high quality t-shirt in there that's got the company logo on it, uh, that's got a nice book that has nothing to do with financial planning that you thought might be of interest, you know, other things. You just, you know, put whatever you want in there. And we've got, um, you know, iron... uh, our company named Iron Shield Financial Planning. We've got Iron Shield uh, grocery bags, you know, the reusable bags, because they're something that everybody needs now. And so we, you know, we put them together. We get some really high quality ones and it just works out well. So, you know, always be looking out. And one of the things that we do with our staff is whenever we have a staff meeting, I'm always saying, listen, if you guys come across anything that was just a wow experience, because I want to incorporate those into my business, into my practice. And so anytime you come across anything that you really, really find was a wow experience, simply take note of it, go back and see how you can work it into your process. So all of this, put it together, it's simply going to help you build a better business. You've been listening to Scott E. Plaskett, a certified financial planner and industry veteran in the world of fee-based financial planning. Want free resources to help you build a better fee-based financial planning firm? Visit ilovefinancialplanning.com right now to register for Scott's Inner Circle email list where you'll get front-of-the-line updates on the latest resources that are driving profits to Scott's fee-based financial planning practice. All of the resources are pulled directly from the highly acclaimed fee-based financial Financial Planning Mastery Academy. Go now to ilovefinancialplanning.com. Build a better business and make more money with your fee-based financial planning practice today.